Um, nice to meet you all. I'm happy that there is so much interest here, like the room is completely packed. If it were up to me, we'd just stay in the auditorium, then we'd also have more comfortable chairs, but uh, I'm not the one deciding. So welcome, my name is Bart van Herp. I'm one of the co-founders of our company, Lays Dynamics, and I'm also a PhD student here at the University in Eindhoven. And today I will be talking about the new kind of AI, brain-inspired natural AI. And we're going to figure out, okay, what does it take to make real intelligent systems? Ready? So that's enough about me. Um, I was also kind of curious about who are we actually, who am I talking to today? So I asked my personal assistant, like, what can you tell me about the Pi Data audience here in this room? And my assistant nicely replied, well, the Pi Data conference boasts an enthusiastic blend of Python and data enthusiasts, from seasoned experts to eager newcomers. It's a dynamic hub for knowledge exchange and excitement about the cutting edge developments in the data realm. Does that sound about right? ChatGPT knows, right? But it was also a small remark, but be careful of the person in the white shirt in the front left. He or she seems like a critical person. So I'm not sure which side left, but uh, let's keep the questions to the end. Perfect. <laughs> it's also the first, or almost the first talk in the morning, so I can imagine that you're still a bit sleepy, a bit down. So um, I also asked, okay, how can we wake everyone up? How can we make sure that everyone is fully present here in this room? And also ChatGPT came up with some nice suggestions. So um, energetic music, we can do some physical activities. The room is a bit small. So what I asked it is, okay, what if I promise you all coffee afterwards? And apparently that's also a great idea. So let's do that. And um, after this talk, we'll grab a coffee and uh, then we have some nice chats. Welcome also. It's quite impressive, this ChatGPT. It's actually very cool. So if you have a look at how quickly ChatGPT was adopted by almost everyone around the world, then it's a bit too enthusiastic. Then it only took five days for ChatGPT to reach a million users, a million people actually making use of this service. In comparison, Instagram, it took like 75 days, and Spotify, 150. So it's impressive that this ChatGPT kind of conquered the world. Just five days to reach a million users. And this goes on quite quickly, right? So I'm not sure how many people are using it right now. I think, please raise your hand if you've used it. Perfect. So everyone knows that it's really cool. And that's also um, very nice to work with. Even my parents are now asking, hey Bart, this ChatGPT, uh, should I know this? What can I use this for? Will it benefit me? For them it doesn't, but <laughs> they are asking and for my parents that's already quite a big step to get in touch with this kind of, uh, yeah, with this kind of technology. But with ChatGPT, did we unlock true intelligence? So we've all used it, we try to push its boundaries, but there are of course also limitations, right? Uh, to give also some other examples on from, from works that are out there. This is like an image prompt that was generated, I think it's like a year ago. So where we asked the... I think the button is stuck or something. <laughs> okay. Where we asked it to generate some images of a salmon in a river. And you get these very nice pictures, but it's exactly not what you want. Like maybe for Michelin dining, this would be nice that you have like a river and you can actually eat the salmon there. But this is not what we intended. So it's doing a great job, but it's also, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it intelligent. And there is also this very cool, uh, I, think, I think it was funny, I came across it lately. So it's this uh, robot vacuum and it sends this message to the user. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm stuck at a cliff. Well, a bit dramatic if, you, uh, dramatic if you ask me. So it's very cool, very cool AI. We can do a lot of things, but it's also still limited to a certain extent. Is it then really intelligent? We think it isn't. Because generative AI 
as ChatGPT has also some pitfalls. For example, it's not really adaptable. So uh, we know that it keeps on training and it does its thing, but it's not really encountering data as it goes along. It's trained on like the entire internet. And that was its training set. And then based on that, it tries to make good predictions. It tries to engage you in this conversation. But as soon as something new arrives, it's kind of struggling with adapting. Yeah. It's also intelligence, it goes automatically. Furthermore, ChatGPT, for example, generative AI, they're usually black box systems. If you ask someone, oh, what's actually inside? No one knows. They have some intuition on how it works and how, or how this actually uh, manages to still generate some nice prompts. But actually how it works in detail, it's very difficult. And that also brings us kind of to the last point. So it's very resource hungry. I looked it up yesterday and GPT-4, although exact numbers are not known, it's estimated to have like a trillion parameters. That's quite insane, right? So um, maybe Polars can also help us with loading these trillions parameters. Uh, but it's a lot and also energy consumption is also quite significant. Not only for training, because training itself costs like millions of dollars. Uh, but also just like running it, like we're melting away the polar caps. And uh, I think that's something that we don't want by just fueling these data centers. So these are kind of some limitations of the AI that we currently know. So what's up next? Well, maybe the, true, the key to true AI is given by this person. So this person on the right is Carl Friston. He's a renowned neuroscientist stationed at London, in London, and he has some ideas on how true AI actually should work, how this can be really intelligent. Um, and he has developed this concept called the free energy principle. It sounds very theoretical, so far it kind of is, but it talks about how uh, autonomous agent or person or being how it should interact with its environment in order to really enforce in intelligent behavior and also to survive. Because in the end, for some kind of autonomous uh, being, survival is one of the few goals. And he talks about a couple of properties that these agents or systems should adhere to. So first of all, they should be able to learn online. So ChatGPT was trained on the entire internet, let's say. But that's actually that's something that we do not want. We want it to incorporate like a stream of data and that it then can learn whilst it's going. To give a simple example, if you were to ride a bike, right? If you want to ride a bike, you're not gonna watch documentaries at uh, the age of uh, three or four, five, six. Um, you're not gonna watch hours of documentaries. Oh, if I do this, then uh, I fall down and no, you're just gonna hop on, gonna try experience. So that's kind of also what this true AI, or this intelligent AI, should adhere to. Furthermore, you also want it to be explainable. So as I talked about these black box models, we have no idea what's going on there. But in a sense, if we are thinking about intelligent systems, then we should be able to decompose them. We should be able to uh, explain how they are behaving, why they come up with certain reasoning. Under this free energy principle that this guy called Friston advocates, he says that these systems should adhere to a sense of logic. In our case, we talk usually about probability theory because these capture the formalisms of actually human logic on how we perceive things and how we interact with our environment. And furthermore, we want it to be energy efficient. So um, we want it, for example, to be able to multitask. Like we humans are capable of doing a lot of things at once, although performance in these tasks slowly deteriorates as uh, soon as you start doing more at once. And the current systems are focused on one task speci uh, specifically. So with these three kind of properties, we hope to develop an intelligent form of artificial intelligence. And that's under this free energy principle. So throughout the entire history, 
we have come across a variety of fields. So we have the signal processing, communication, control theory, robotics, machine learning. And all of these people, these brilliant minds, have brought forward equations which we used and we thought was very relevant. Just out of curiosity, who knows like, three of these equations? Who knows four? Is there also someone who knows all five? Familiar with all five? Very impressive. So on the left we have the actually um, the Fourier transform which decomposes a time domain signal into its frequency components in high and low pitches. We have our or our uh, channel capacity, how many bits can we send over a specific transmission channel. In control theory we have our Kalman filter, how do we incorporate uh, observations which have a certain uncertainty about them. We have the famous Bellman equation, Robert Richard Bellman, and the last one is very famous in machine learning, backpropagation or the chain rule. But what we what it turns out is this natural AI, that uh, this free energy principle, actually we can phrase all of these different things in terms of minimization of the free energy. So actually free energy is all you need. And that makes this also very attractive. So if we develop a true kind of intelligence, then it would mean that there is only one thing that we're going to optimize. Only one thing that's at the core, let's say, at the core of an intelligent human agent, namely this free energy. And with that we can discover the algorithms developed in the past and we can phrase them as such. So let me introduce to you the Gartner hype cycle it's called. So Gartner is a very um, pretty well known consultancy firm in the, in, uh, in the technology business. And every year they publish kind of their hype cycle, which demonstrates the maturity of a certain type of uh, technology. So all the way on the right, we have computer vision. So we're quite far with this. We know what we can do, and that's already quite a lot. Um, and we kind of have reached the plateau. Like everyone knows it's there. We're all using it. It's very cool, but that's that. Autonomous vehicles, they were at some point very popular and then kind of popularity decreased. But now we're getting to the point where it's actually being used also in industry. So you have these self-driving taxis, for example, in some places around the world already. So we're slowly getting there. All the way on the top, we have generative AI, like ChatGPT. A lot of expectations, but we don't really see this back into industry yet. So where is natural AI? So with Lace Dynamics, natural AI is actually still here in the beginning. So it's uh, undergoing research and development in order to bring it also to industry. But it's still very novel, very new, and no one is actually, or almost no one, is working on this particular topic. For computer vision and generative AI, in order to make their advances possible, we had like amazing software toolboxes. So we know, for example, OpenCV is, uh, for computer vision was widely used. Uh, for generative AI, with TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Keras, all these kinds of software packages, and they have made these technologies to where they are today. They have made it that everyone can now work with generative AI. If you just go on YouTube, type in some words, you can train your own neural network, let's say. But for natural AI, this is still missing. We do not have software that actually allows us to create real intelligence. And that's where Lace Dynamics comes in. So with Lace Dynamics, we try to bridge the gap from the kind of theoretical research that Carl Friston advocates to actually industry applications. And the way that we do this is with our uh, toolbox, written also by Dimitri, and other members of our team uh, called Rx Infer. And what it does, it automates the minimization of free energy. So this thing that we needed to minimize to get true intelligent behavior, 
That's what this toolbox automates. And why is that very nice? If we have, for example, a company called Roomba Inc. and they want to make adaptive and also collaborative robot vacuum cleaners. They have this certain problem. And what we do with Lace Dynamics is we build a specific model for them, which is interpretable, explainable, can learn and adapt online. And then in this model, we do this reasoning, this, uh, this logic, and we automate this with our toolbox Rx Refer. And if we do this, we end up with the new generation of ro um, robot vacuum cleaners. Doesn't sound too impressive, of course. But the same holds for another company, Drones Incorporated, who wants to make adaptive and collaborative drone drones. The only thing that changes in this story is our model. We make a model that's, our, that's drone specific, explainable, uh, adaptive, and then again we run inference with our toolbox. We automate it, just like TensorFlow does or PyTorch does on the models, machine learning models that you're used today. And with that we can build yeah, a new generation of drones. A very short introduction of what we're doing. Um, if you're interested, please check us out on lasynamics.com. I would also love to talk to you afterwards. Like, um, I have to leave after lunch, so if there are a lot of questions, just please reach out to me during the coffee breaks. Also check out our toolbox. It's on GitHub, it's in Julia. Although we're in PyData, of course, there are excellent uh, Julia wrappers. So nonetheless, I would recommend checking it out, rxrefer.ml. Um, ah, and of course, we're going to grab some coffee afterwards. Thanks a lot for your attention. It was a pleasure being here. Very full room. Good that you're enthusiastic. And if you want to know more, of course, just reach out to me afterwards. Um, and then I would like to give the floor for some questions. Thank you. You talked a lot about generative AI, but you didn't mention reinforcement learning. Uh, and also reinforcement learning is similar in the sense that there is a, a reward optimization function that you want to either maximize or minimize. The question is, where does it stand compared to this natural AI? Because it, what natural AI does is very similar to agents, which are actually intelligence. And generative AI is not about intelligence, it's about coping. Reinforcement is about adapting to the environment. Second question is where dark bias uh, comes into the play, because uh, uh, you didn't explain why uh, uh, Bayes uh, probability enters into the game of uh, natural AI, as you call it. Very yeah. good questions. Thanks a lot. Um, so maybe the critical person was actually here, and not in the, the front left, but uh, very good. So with regards to reinforcement learning, so there, I agree, uh, it's a very cool field, and you are completely right. So they try to learn through experiences. But they're also quite often relatively inefficient in doing so. So if you have a simple model, it takes a huge amount of trials just to get up and running. Um, with this natural form of AI is that we, we do not only want to optimize this reward function, but at the same time we want to make, yeah, we want to learn, right? We don't just want to exploit this reward function, but we also want to kind of explore. We want to explore what's, what's around there, what's, uh, what useful states might actually lead to a benefit in obtaining this reward. So in a sense, natural AI can be phrased as, or I would say it the other way around, reinforcement learning can be phrased as also this free energy minimization. The thing is that re, um, natural AI shines in this element because it's not only exploitative, so it doesn't only optimize this value function, but it's also explorative, so it tries to gain as much information as possible. And then with regard to your second question, um, I didn't touch uh, a lot about this indeed, probability theory and bias and all that kind of stuff, because I thought it would be a bit much for this uh, 10 o'clock <laughs> 10 o'clock talk. But uh, what we try to do is we try the models to become like adaptive, that they learn online. And in a sense, they, will devel they might develop a bias. If they are just in one situation, they might develop a bias for that particular situation. But that's not a problem because they're also adaptive. So if you move to a different environment, then we want the model, in a sense, to recognize, oh, 
I actually don't know this. Out of distribution, some people might call it. And then we want the model to adapt to this situation. In the end, we want models to also grow over time. So instead of having a static model that we try to fit all our data on, we want a model that grows depending on the needs and on the tasks at hand, and also on the environment. And in a sense, that alleviates this, this bias problem. Yeah. Does that clarify? Yeah, no, no, and this raises another question. So this is more about the, the, the way that uh, uh, things learn. Because if I have a reinforcement learning agent, I would explore the space. If I have a given distribution, I would explore the space, the one sample at a time. While if I use very advanced bias, I can imagine that there is some given prior, and then instead of exploring one single data point, and then collecting data points in a sort of Monte Carlo sampling, have a distribution function and they try to maximize or minimize over an integral of the distribution function. That's what kind of I understood of what, uh, what you said. Yeah, so the thing is we try to keep away and refrain from uh, from sampling because it's it's slow it's to just pick out one of the points. Um, instead, we do something in a very modular fashion. We do this free energy minimization uh, by something called message passing. A bit extreme, but basically what it does, it does probability theory, but then very localized. So that we can create modular structures where each local part still obeys the rules of probability theory. Um, regarding the other points, I think we should have a chat afterwards because it's uh, to be quite in depth. But I like, uh, yeah, I like the thoughts. Thank you. In what way does this uh, open up the black box? In a sense that we can build the models al ourselves. So it becomes very easy to incorporate model-specific knowledge, domain-specific knowledge in our models. Of course, we can also do something similar with, uh, with machine learning or deep learning networks. Um, but this, yeah, we can specify the model ourselves. If there are things, for example, if we talk about audio processing, uh, just to give a rough example, we know that our brain, how it does this, it has these auditory cortexes on the somewhere next to your ear canal, and they perform kind of a frequency decomposition of your signal. This is something that you can insert already in your model and use this information, whereas the actual audio processing, I have no idea what's going on in my head. Sometimes I'm also uh, asking this. So, in, in a sense, explainable, means to me that we can make a clear distinction between the parts that are model-based and also things that we just don't know and we want to want to learn over time. Um, nonetheless, if we, say to say it very bluntly, if we just insert a huge model, we still want to know which parts of this model are actually relevant. And we have done some research on this and also quite interesting works. So um, what we did is we built like a Bayesian neural network. It's just a neural network with priors and probability theory. <coughs> and we checked, okay, can we get rid of weights? Because our model had like 600 parameters, not that much. But for a certain tasks, it turned out that we can reduce this model down to just two parameters. So if we have ChatGPT, GPT-4 with like, say, a trillion, maybe only a million of them are relevant. That's something we don't know. So in a sense, this explainability comes in one form that we have a model-based structure, but also in a sense that we can figure out which part of the model are actually relevant <coughs> um, to the tasks that we're solving. But but then still a model of uh, of uh, uh, six hundred uh, parameters would still be complex to grasp. Yeah. That's true, but sometimes you need uh, you need you, yeah you don't know how a certain type of processing comes along. So uh, yeah, black box models are still useful, not denying that, but we should get yeah more explainability into them. Thanks. Guys, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Bart. And I think that there are plenty of more questions, but uh, I would like to just uh, thank him. Uh.